course yet, but I'm thinking of dropping one of my other courses and take it. Do you mind if I sit in? Oh, Brilliant, thanks. Yeah. You have this? If you don't have it, just pass it. Okay, folks. Get. Let's settle in here. There should be three handouts. The three handouts, one says introduction to valuation, the second says syllabus, the third says projects. Make sure you have all three. Okay. Okay, everybody have the handouts? <coughs> first things first, uh, let me make sure you're in the right class. This is valuation. Okay. Actually, there's an interesting history to this class that you should probably know. I came to NYU in 1986. I'll be, I'll be getting my 25th anniversary pin. They actually give you a pin or a star or something soon. And the first class they gave me to teach was called Security Analysis. It's a class that was created, I think, in the 1940s. And it hadn't changed since. So they gave me this class and I looked at it and it was a little bit of, it was like, it was like a gumball. It was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They threw everything into the mix, you know, one week on stocks, one week on, I didn't even think they'd caught up with derivatives yet. So they talked a little bit about what options and futures were. But I looked at that class and said, I'm not teaching this class. It's an incredibly boring class. It's, it's got no central theme to it. It's got a pieces of puzzles, but nothing there. So, I decided to teach a valuation class, but I've also realized with my experience with academia that this bureaucracy is so dense that it's not worth fighting. So I've decided to become subversive about the whole thing. So what I did was I hijacked the security analysis class and I taught a valuation class. In fact, I sounded out some of the senior faculty on that, and they said that's okay that, you, that you're hijacking the class. Nobody really cares about the description of the class. But you really don't have enough stuff to teach valuation for an entire semester. And you know what? In 1986, they were right. And I looked at material to teach the class. Valuation in 1986 was truly pitiful. I mean, if you looked at what people did, they had the Gordon, have you seen the Gordon growth model? Dividends, cost of equity growth rate, it was one equation. That was valuation, as was. So we taught that one equation, that now you know everything there is to know about valuation, go out and do valuation. So part of the reason I actually wrote my first book was to provide material for my own class. So in a sense, this class has kind of grown with it. To show you how little I have an appetite for fighting the bureaucracy, they renamed the class. They called it Equity Instruments and Markets, I think, for 18 years. Now, to be quite honest, I, I have nothing to say about markets. There's only one equity instrument as far as I'm concerned, and it's called Common Stock. 
And I'm not even sure I want to talk about equity, equity, and equity for the rest of the semester. So I still taught valuation, and I called it equity instruments and markets. Finally, they caught up with my subversion two years ago. They could have done two things. Punish me by saying, you can't teach the class, in which case I said, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I can walk away from this. <laughs> they, they looked at the enrollment. They said, I can't punish the guy by making him not teach the class. We let him call it whatever he wants. So my days of subversion are over. This class is now called what it actually is. It is a valuation class. Okay? And in a sense, it's a topic that is always timely. The reason I bring this up, you will be amazed at how many emails I get from people saying, is valuation still relevant? What the heck do you mean? Is it still relevant? When did it stop becoming relevant? But that's the same question I heard in the late 90s at the peak of the dot-com bubble. Is valuation still relevant? Then you have the crash. Is valuation still relevant? Now you have another boom and another crash. Is valuation still relevant? I firmly believe, and I hope to bring this through in this class, that valuation today is more relevant than ever before. You can afford to be sloppy when times are good. You can afford to take shortcuts, and a lot of people do. You can't afford to do that when times are crunched, which is basically where we are right now. So if, if anything else, I think this brings home the point that valuation has always mattered. And when you deviate from valuation, you pay a price. And we're paying a price. Okay. So let me set the administrative stuff kind of out of the way. Then we kind of jump in and talk about what this class is going to be about. Okay. So how many of you were in my corporate finance class? I see a lot of familiar faces. Okay. How many of you were not in my corporate? I should have asked that question differently. Okay. Two things. One is. Uh, there, you're not at a significant disadvantage for two reasons. One, is, you know, I will kind of review in a very compressed format what I did in my corporate finance class. The other is you can always go and watch my entire corporate finance class <laughs> in time if you truly are confused. Okay? So don't worry, you can catch up. So the, the reason I bring that up is for those of you who were in my corporate finance class, you know how to get in touch with me. But those of you who weren't, then I might as well go over the administrative details. My office is in this building, 996. I don't bite. You can come in. Right? My phone number is listed there. I never answer the phone. I don't check my voicemail. So you can leave me as many messages as you want. It'll never get to me. I'll say, oh. I basically let it fill up and kind of get wiped out. I found that works very well. So the best way to get in touch with me, of course, is my email. This is my big semester. I have the corporate finance class, which had 428 people this morning, and I have you. So you're my tiny class. So I can, I can deal with this class. So, but my email, I'm pretty good about answering my email. In fact, I, I finally succumbed and got a BlackBerry last year, an instrument I hate, because it now means my email chases me around no matter where I am. So if you do send me an email, I will always get it, and I will respond pretty quickly. I will not try to reply for my BlackBerry, because I still haven't mastered the art of big fingers and small buttons. My daughter laughs at me, you know. But uh, so, if you do send me a message, I will read it on my BlackBerry. But I'll get back to my computer before I answer it. My home page. I'll come back and talk about your, your life is going to revolve around a lot of stuff you pull off that page. So I'll come back to that. Uh, the my office hours are built around my two classes because I teach 10:30 to 12 for the corporate finance class and 1:30 to 3. I've kind of compressed the office hours around those classes. Okay. But remember the fair game principle. You don't, right? If you find me, I'm fair game. So my job is to make sure you don't find me. But if you do find me, elevator, street, restroom, wherever. <laughs> restroom is kind of unfair because it means that only half of the class roughly then can find me. Okay? <laughs> I am fair game. So I am the, the one excuse I don't want you to have at the end of the semester is I couldn't find them and ask them the question. You can always ask me the question either in person or in email. All the classes will be webcast, as one well, of well my corporate finance classes. But I have some exciting news. Let's see if it's actually working. They actually installed a new program in here called Echo 360, which means the way the webcast, for those of you who were in my corporate finance class, worked was there was video. But the video was abysmal. Because all it did was catch me. You'd have this tiny figure of me kind of scurrying around in the front. A picture of the overhead you couldn't even see. But the audio was OK. Now, actually, with Echo 360, this is what you should start seeing. The technology can always play tricks on you, starting with this class. You should see the slide on the side. You'll see the audio 
actually on top. So basically, with the with the tiny, so the video will be there, but really the slide. So you can actually be able to track the audio with the slides as you go along. And since you can print off the slides, it basically means you don't have to come to class after today. No, actually, don't don't take that seriously. Though as second year MBAs, I know the temptation will be there around March. You don't, you you guys have a tendency to graduate prematurely. <laughs> Somewhere around March, you think you've done it all. So. But this is, think of it as a backup. I'd rather that you be in class than not be in class. But if you're not in class, I'd rather you watch the webcast than not watch the webcast. And even if you're in class, you can always go and use the webcast if there are things that are not quite clear. Okay. The other good news is this semester, because of the Echo 360, as they're making the webcast, it automatically is going to become a podcast. My vision of, of a dream day would be to walk down a New York City street and watch somebody in their iPod watching me. <laughs> I know that's not going to happen, you know. You never know, you know. I could peek over and say, hey, good lecture over there, right? right? So the podcasts are there for a simple reason. The webcasts actually are a live stream. You have to have a fast internet connection or you can't watch it. The podcasts are downloadable. So you can download it and watch it on the plane or wherever, you know. So it makes it a little more flexible. So let's see how it works. This is the first semester they're trying the new system. And from my experience with new systems, is they're destined to fail. It's a question of when, not whether. So let's see how it works. They worked really hard to get this up to, you know, up to speed. But it'll be exciting to see how it works out. Okay. Final link over there, which is in blue, and you can't even see it, is the, web, is the website for this class. This is the place you will go for almost everything associated with this class. You think, what about Blackboard? What about Blackboard? I don't need, I mean, I don't really use it because this is the main site. This semester I've made a resolution that I will try to at least keep Blackboard updated. I promise you I will break that resolution sooner rather than later. So this is the place you should go and everything for this class will be on this site. Okay? So the syllabus, if you click on it, you'll see the, what you have there. Uh, the assignments and projects I'll talk about. Every exam and quiz I've ever given in valuation, since I teach it twice a year, this is 20 years of exams and quizzes is on there. So you can go look up. And of course, the solutions are there as well, so otherwise it's useless. I send on average about, those of you in my corporate finance class know, a lot of emails, six emails a week. Last time I taught valuation last semester, I had 115 emails by the end of the 15th week, which means clear a lot of space in your mailbox just for me. Get rid of the strategy emails, accounting, you don't need those. You know, really it's not going to make a big difference in your life. This is the class in which you have to make sure you get the emails. I do have an email chronicle on the site. Say, so what the heck is an email chronicle? I know you're going to come to me about three weeks and say, I didn't get that email. It's coming. I mean, it's, I, don't, I never got that email. It went into my junk box, whatever. Th this email chronicle will take every email sent in this class and it will get created into a document so you can actually see every. So by the time the class is over, you'll see all 115 emails listed by date. So you can always go back and check that particular date and make sure the email is there. Okay? This is something you didn't see in the corporate finance class. Every week, I'm going to send you what I call a weekly challenge, starting with this week, maybe next, and maybe next week I'll start. What the weekly challenge is is something we did that week, taking an extra step. So it'll be a challenge saying, "Hey, can you take what we did this week and try this out?" I will not grade you. I will not even ask you to return it to me. So you can just basically throw it in the junk pile if that, that's your inclination. But if you really want to kind of take your valuation, take it the extra step, this will kind of force you to think about how can I expand this? How can I take what I did in class and expand it? So there'll be about 13 weekly challenges pretty much every week for as we go through, which will take that week's topic and extend it. Okay. The lecture notes I already emailed you. So the, those of you, I see a lot of packets you've already bought. If you bought the packet, that's great because it's already there. If you haven't bought the packet, Print it off. Just make sure you don't use the printers in the school. They don't like that. And do bring your lecture notes. That's the one thing that I, I that I think you should bring to class because all the slides will be on in your lecture notes. You can make the notes on the side rather than trying to copy everything down as you go through. Okay. You you already got the link for the Google Calendar for the class, so you can see when the quizzes are. So you have no excuse for saying I didn't know the quiz was coming. You know exactly when the quizzes are coming, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So everything is on the Google Calendar. 
The rest is pretty much as we go through, we'll talk about it. Okay. No questions yet, right? That's it. Okay. So what is this class about? As I said, this is a class about valuation. Okay. We're going to talk about valuation, valuation, and more valuation. There'll be no tangents, no side steps, because there's enough in valuation for us to spend 15 weeks on it. Valuations are what? Pretty much everything. I mean, my theme for this class is by the end of the class, you should be able to value any asset. Notice I said any asset. It could be a company. It could be just an individual asset. It, and in a sense, I want to look at the spectrum. In fact, we'll talk about three different approaches to valuation and cover all three. The first approach is intrinsic valuation. What is intrinsic valuation? It's just a fancy way of saying the value of an asset is based on its fundamentals, the cash flows, the risk in that asset. So we're going to talk about intrinsic valuation. The second way of approaching valuation is relative valuation. You value an asset based on what other people are willing to pay for the asset. Think of it as an eBay extension to valuation. An asset is worth what, you, what other people pay. And the third approach to valuation is to value it contingent on something happening. That's basically option pricing. Every valuation approach out there is going to fall into one of these three boxes. So we'll talk about all three approaches. We'll talk about not just how to value a company, but how to change that value. So basically, if I came to you with a company and said, tell me the value of the company, not only do I want you to be able to estimate the value of any company, I need you to be able to take that company and say, if I ran that company, and that requires a bit of an ego. So develop a bit of an ego as you go through. And say, if I ran that company, what would I do differently in the company? And what are the consequences for valuation? A big issue right now when you talk, when you look at companies that are badly managed and badly run, it's an issue in every acquisition because that's an acquiring company. When you buy a target company, you plan to change the way the company's run. But I want to talk about ways of changing value. I also want to talk about why different people might have different perspectives on value. What different people? We can start with managers. Why the value of a company to a manager might be different from the value of the company to investors in the company to value of the company to an analyst looking at the company. You saying if they get three different values, how do I know which one is right? That's part of the process that we're going to examine. How, when we get different estimates of value, can we look at a value and say, that value is a more consistent estimate than this one? Finally, I also want to look across the life cycle. In fact, if all we did was value mature companies that made money, I could be done today. I could give you the tools you need to value a mature company that makes money. If valuation were about rules, there are very few rules, so you'd be done. The problem with valuation is for every rule, there are 100 exceptions. So what I want to talk about is valuing companies across the life cycle. Where in the life cycle? Companies start as idea businesses, right? So if I came to you with a small private idea business, I want you to be able to tell me what that business is worth. This is where entrepreneurship starts, right? As you move up the life cycle, you have incredible growth. You're a growth company. You're the Google of 2006. I come to say value Google for me. I need you to be able to estimate a value for a high growth company. Moving further up the life cycle, I come to you with a company which is a mature company, a 3M. Say, what's the value 3M? I need you to be able to assess the value of a mature company. And here are the most depressing valuations of all. Your company gets past the mature phase. It's in decline. I come to you with Sears and say, what's the value of Sears? It's depressing because it's natural when you do valuation to put in growth, growth rates, right? You want your company to get bigger. That's it. So in your spreadsheet, you can make companies big. With these companies, you'll actually be reducing the companies. We want to talk about how to value companies in decline or worse, in distress. So if I asked you to value four, a very difficult valuation because we're not talking about growth prospects. We're talking about can they hold on to what they have right now? So I want to talk about being able to value companies anywhere in the life cycle, from young growth companies to companies in distress. In other words, at the end of this process, we want to look at valuation in any metric, any, any particular scenario you might face. Because let's face it, you are going to face companies that stretch across the scenarios. You can't just say, I can value mature companies, but I really can't deal with growth companies. That's not good enough. We need to be able to value any company. So with that background, let's structure the class. We're going to start off the first two sessions laying a philosophical foundation for valuation. You're saying philosophical foundations. In other words, I want to ask, why do we even bother? This is my response to those people who said, hey, what's the point of doing valuation anymore? 
So I want to start off by laying a philosophical foundation. And this is going to be personal. I'm going to tell you why I think valuation matters. Now, you've got to figure out why valuation might matter to you. Of course, you could conclude that valuation doesn't matter to you, but that's fine. Make the judgment yourself. Then we're going to spend about eight sessions reviewing corporate finance. Why? Because I'm assuming you've forgotten a lot. If I asked you what the free cash flow to equity is, you guys want to take up the challenge, actually, and remember what you did in corporate finance? Some of you might be able to, but a, a remarkable short-term memory loss that you, which you have, which is whatever happened in corporate finance was eons ago. So we're going to go back and hit on some of the topics we dealt with in corporate finance. But we're going to extend them. Things like the risk-free rate, risk premiums, betas, cost of debt, cost of capital, cash flows. If none of this sounds even familiar, then you really are in big trouble, and neither of you. <laughs> But I will assume nothing. I'll start at ground zero and build up because I've discovered that when I assume things, I always get, I always end up in trouble somewhere along the way. So we're going to spend up eight, se basically eight sessions reviewing the inputs into valuation. How do we estimate discount rates, cash flows, growth rates, and bring them, bring, get the pieces ready. We will not value a single company fully until the 11th session. Because until we get the inputs nailed down, there's no point jumping the gun and say, let's value a company. Once we've got the inputs nailed down in two sessions, we're going to look at a, a spectrum of companies, about 15 companies, again, ranging from regulated utilities all the way to young companies, and talk about what's different across the companies, but more important, what's common across companies. <laughs> what we're going to discover is you can slice this and dice this as much as you want, but valuation fundamentally remains the same no matter what kind of company you look at. So by the end of the 12th session, we're going to have a pretty good handle on intrinsic valuation, or discounted cash flow valuation, if you prefer that term. Then so what are we going to do with the rest of the class? We have talked about the second way of doing valuation, value an asset based on how much other people are willing to pay. Let's face it, that's the way most people do valuation. If any of you bought a house, you're probably regretting it now. <laughs> Think of what, how you decided what to pay for the house. You didn't sit there saying, let me do an intrinsic valuation of the house, right? Did you try? Let me protect the cash flows. Now, generally, the way you decided how much to pay for the house was you looked at what other people in the neighborhood were paying for similar houses. And you can already see the limits of this approach, right? Because no two houses are similar. So you've got to control for, hey, they had more bedrooms, I have a bigger backyard. So that's basically what relative valuation is. I'm going to extend that concept and look at how it's applied with stocks and how it's misapplied with stocks. What am I talking about when I talk about relative valuation with stocks? How does it manifest itself? Where, how do you see it? You see a multiple and you see comparables, right? You see an equity research report. What do you see? PE ratio of 17 companies. This company looks cheap because it trades at 11 times earnings. Look at these 17 companies. They all traded 15 times earnings. 95% of valuation often takes that form. It's impossible for me to fight that and say, no, always do intrinsic valuation. In fact, I'm going to argue that relative valuation is a place in everybody's arsenal, but we need to do it right. So essentially, those six, those sessions, 13 through 17, are about how to do relative valuation right. Or put another way, how to detect when people are doing it wrong, because there's a lot of bad relative valuation out there. Once we get that done, I want to spend a couple of sessions on a subset of valuation, valuing, valuing private businesses. Again, 90% of what we're going to do for private businesses is going to be very similar to what we do for publicly traded companies. But there are estimation issues specific to private companies that I want to deal with. Accounting issues, uh, discount rate issues. I want to come back and talk about them. Okay? Then once we've got that part nailed down, we can talk about the last aspect of valuation, which is applying option pricing models. Not to value options. That's for an options class. But to value conventional assets. This is what falls under the rubric of real options. We got started on it in, this, in corporate finance when you talked about capital budgeting and the option to delay and the option to expand. Here we're actually going to use it in valuation of securities of companies and how it applies. The last three sessions are going to be about extending. Now, by, the, by, the, by the 22nd session, if I've done my job, you'll have all your ducks in a row. You'll know the mechanics of valuation. You'll know what to do with it. Then I can turn you loose and say, OK, here's a company. How would you change the value of the company? You're going to see that once you understand the mechanics of valuation, changing value 
becomes almost a trivial exercise. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but reflecting changes in a way a company is run in value is very simple to do if you keep it simple, if you, if you start with valuation mechanics. So I want to talk about value enhancement. Okay. And I'm going to close off by talking about a word you often see in the context of acquisitions, control. I want to talk specifically about what's different in acquisition valuations, primarily control, but also synergy. How do you value them? How do you bring them in? Okay. That's pretty much it. So as you see, you, you know, the, the, the examples we're going to cover are going to stretch the spectrum and look across different approaches. Now, there are three different valuation books. I don't care which one you have or even whether you have one, to be quite honest. These books are supplementary reading. I think, of course, they're useful. I like what the author's written in these books. <laughs> Obviously, since I, you know, hey. but you don't have to buy them. I know how obscenely overpriced books are. You can pretty much get much of the material from the book by going to my website. It's just a lot more work because you got to download slices. Here are the three books I have. Now, the investment valuation book is probably the book most relevant for this class, hey, which is the. Do, do, any, do any of you have that book? That, that's a. I don't know. What What does it cost? The bookstore. Ninety-five. 95. It's actually cheaper than the paperback corporate finance book that costs 104. Go figure. Right? This is the publishing business in a nutshell. Okay? Charge what the customer will bear. Okay? So that's the book that actually, that's about a, it's, it's about 1,200 pages. So you're paying less than tenth of a cent per page or something like that. So it's okay. okay? We'll pretty much cover that entire book in this class. Okay? The other book that might be that might work is my second edition of Demodern Valuation, which was my very first valuation book. It's actually structured differently. What's different between investment valuation and that, that book is investment valuation is structured the old-fashioned way. It starts with topics and it goes through. Demodern Valuation is actually structured more for practitioners. It doesn't have practice prompts at the end of every chapter, so that might be a factor if you're thinking about it. Don't buy the dark side for two reasons. One, it was written in 2001, so it's dated. The second is I'm writing the second edition of the book. In fact, I'm 90% of the way through. I'm actually going to slip it in and put it on my website in about six weeks, and I'm going to let you download it for free. Just don't make an issue of it with my publisher. Okay? So don't be stupid and send an email to me. Somebody did this, actually. Send an email to my publisher saying, you know, in fact, this is the reason I had, to, I had all my books online until some idiot did this. So don't. Don't do that. No, so if you're going to download it, download it and, and read it. Don't, don't make an issue of it. Right? So don't buy dark side. If you already have it, sell it. This is the time to do it. This is perfect timing. Okay? <laughs> you have inside information. Okay? And it's not SEC regulated. So you can basically go out and sell it now on Amazon or wherever you want to sell it because they don't have a, the faintest idea that the second edition is coming. Right? Material for the class, the lecture note packets, as I said, is, are online. Uh, the textbooks I talked about. There are a bunch of other readings online that I would recommend that you take a look at. Basically, we go and let me click on that so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. These are actually not academic papers. Basically, they're things like Wall Street Journal articles, Business Week articles, relevant to the topic of the day. For instance, we're going to talk a lot about bias and valuation. These are all Wall Street Journal articles or Barron's articles that I've discovered over time that are relevant to the topic. So they're, they're actually very quick reads. It'll take you two minutes or three minutes to kind of browse through each article. So they really are not going to give you a lot of theory or techniques, but they're actually good background to see what the real world thinks about that topic. So if you get a chance, at least for each week, kind of keep up with the readings and, and kind of scan through them. Okay. And let's get the, un the unpleasant stuff out of the way. You've got to have grade at the end of the class. That's unavoidable, so I've got to give you the grade. We're all governed in finance by the same grading distribution. So if you're taking this class for an easy grade, don't. Because it's going to be the same distribution. There are easier ways for you to get this grade with less work in another class. Okay? So let me kind of structure what I'm looking for in terms of grades. I'm n I can't base it on input. You know what I mean by input? I don't know if you, you can come to me in the 15th week and say, I spend 25, weeks, uh, 25 hours every week on valuation. I should get an A. It's not input output, it's based on what I think you can do with valuation. 
My objective when I give you an A at the end of the class, and I hope to give as many of you A's as I can, is that you can value any asset, that you have the flexibility to take what we've learned and extend it. Because as I said, valuation is all about the exceptions. I could teach you models, but they're only as useful as the next company you value. If you're able to kind of extend those models, you will be able to deal with the questions that will come up one year from now, five years from now, seven years from now, when you actually do valuation. That's what I'm going to use to separate those people who know their stuff from those people who don't. Okay? So if you look at the distribution, if you can value any asset, and that's, what, that's going to be my device, so I have to figure out a way to, to test that, then I want to give you an A. If you can value most assets, then it's a B, B plus. If you can value some assets, but you're kind of shaky on most of them, and I said, look, you know, I spent a lot of time on it, but this is not what the class was. If you, if you have no idea, if you're still looking at an envelope and say, what's the value of that envelope, then, then I think we're in deep trouble. Here's the deal I'm willing to make with you. If you come to class, if you kind of hang out with the material, there is no way you should get a D. This is a very low spectrum I'm setting here, right? Eh? <laughs> with great inflation, you're saying, what do you mean, no way to get a B? I mean, I should get at least a B plus. Eh? You should at least, I mean, even a C should be, you, you really need to try in this class to get a C. You have to have some self-destructive impulse, something going on in there that I, psychologically, you've got to meet your psychiatrist to talk about this. I mean, I, I want to make it as easy as, as I can for you to get an A. Now, let me take that back. It's a relative scale. I can't make it as easy as I can. I want to make the material that you need to get an A as accessible as possible. And if you have questions, it's going to help you along. So if you can hang in there, kind of, you know, there'll be weeks when things are difficult to handle and the material is too much. But if you can hang, hang in there, you should be OK. Here's the, the, what the, the actual dis stuff that will go into the grade. There are two projects, and I'll describe them in, 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 a, in detail, which are worth 40%, but I'll come back and talk about them separately. Eh? There, I'll, I'll also have to be quite honest with you. On that 40%, you're not going to get a wide distribution of grades, partly because it's group projects. You don't get it unless you get a really abysmal group. You're not going to get a 15 out of 40. So what I'm trying to say is the spread of grades you get on the group projects is going to be relatively small. The worst project might, the worst group might get 30, the best group might get 40, but you're looking at that spectrum. You know what I'm trying to tell you, right? Even though it's worth 40%, your grade ultimately is going to be determined by how you do in exams and quizzes. Okay. There will be three quizzes. The dates are specified right there. The sessions that they will cover will basically be everything to that session. They're non-cumulative. Session 9 will cover everything from sessions 1 through 8. Session 16 will cover 9 through 15. So they're non-cumulative, but that's a bit of a lie. Partly because everything builds on everything else. If you really don't understand how to get a cost of capital, you're kind of sunk. You're sunk because it all builds on top of that. So if you really have trouble with the early material, kind of wrestle with it. Get, get it under control because that's going to determine how you do on pretty much all the, this. Remember those eight sessions we do on the inputs? They matter more than mo almost everything else you do because if you can get the inputs nailed down, everything else becomes putting it in the right places, right? So they're non-cumulative. They're open book, open notes. Okay. Let me complete the set of rules for the quizzes. They're open book, open notes. If you're going to miss a quiz, you need to let me know before the quiz. Okay, basically, send me an email, something, let me know. Part of the reason for that is administrative. If I don't have that requirement, people can come to class, take the quiz, and view it as a free option. Listen, if you don't do well on the quiz, you put it in your backpack and say, I wasn't at the quiz. So I have no way of, with large classes, of keeping track of who's here, who's not here. So if you're going to miss a quiz, you need to let me know before the quiz. What are the consequences of missing a quiz? If you miss a quiz, first I will have to assume it's for good reason. You know what good reason is? Go to my website. It actually lists good reasons. <laughs> it includes things like physical sickness, mental sickness for your spouse, your child, you. That's OK. Stall subway train. But I will check the MTA website to make sure you're not making this up along the way. I did in the corporate finance class if you have tickets to opening day at Yankee Stadium. I think it's a Thursday, though, so don't try to pull this off, because I know when opening day is. <laughs> so if you show up on a Wednesday and say, today's opening day, and it's not opening day, then you're in big trouble. But if you're opening day, I'll just, you should just give me the ticket. You know, why put yourself through, this, <laughs> through this, the, this, you know, this choice you have to make? 
But it lists out good reasons. But I'll be quite honest with you. If you want to make up a reason, I'm not going to follow you around. You're grown-ups. I mean, if you say I'm sick, I'm going to say, bring a doctor's note in. Bring the doctor in with you. I mean, I'd say, this is silly. So I will assume you're telling me the truth. So you think, what's the cost of missing it then? Initially, there might not be any cost. Because what I will do is I'll take that 10% and move it to whatever's left in the class. Not, I will not move it back. Again, that's to prevent strategic quiz missing. You know what I'm talking about, right? You do really well in the first two quizzes. If I move weights back, you're going to be tempted to miss the third quiz because then it makes your first two quizzes worth more. So it'll always be moved to what's left in the, in, in, the exam, in, the, in the class. So if you miss the first quiz, it'll be second, third, and final exam. If you miss the second quiz, it'll be third and final exam. If you miss the third quiz, it'll be all in the final exam. Okay. Here's the other cost barrier. If you take all three quizzes, I will take your worst quiz and move the score on your worst quiz up to the average score you have on everything, every other exam you took. So in other words, let's say you get a quiz with, you took a quiz and you got a two, but that you average 80% across the other two quizzes in the final exam, I will take the two and make it into an eight. That's a pretty big advantage if you had that one bad day. If you have three bad days, don't even come and talk to me because <laughs> averaging is not going to help you because everything is going to be low. Right? But if you have that one bad quiz, taking all three. So factor that in. It'll be the, I, I think your quizzes might be on Wednesdays. So on Tuesday night, you say, look, I really don't feel like taking the quiz, which is not usually a good reason. But then you concoct a really good reason and send me the email saying, I'm, I have pneumonia. I will not be able to take the quiz. Factor this in as a cost. If you miss a quiz, you, you do lose that waiting option. Quizzes, needless to say, are individual works, so don't. Don't use cultural excuses on me. Don't say, in my culture, we share the quizzes. No, that's fine. You know, I have, I have all the respect in the world for cultural differences. But in this one, it's your quiz in front of you. Just go ahead and do it. Uh, and let the... So th that's basically it. I grade your quizzes. There are, there are two TAs for the class. I will send you there. Aditi Chandrana is, is one. And um, um, blanking out here, who's the other? And David Garcia Lorenza is the other TA. So if two TAs, I will send you their office hours. Don't dump on them. So if you get a bad grade on the quiz, come to me. I grade all the quizzes. If I screwed up, it's my fault. So they have nothing to do with your grading. Okay? So they're there to help you if you have some extended problem in valuation, like I don't know how to get my financial calculator to work with me. Okay? It's rebelling. It's doing strange things. You know? So they're there for a different reason. Don't dump on them. If you have any issues with the class, bring it up with me. And needless to say, all participation is welcome, even if it's tangential. Leave that up to me. So I know you're going to be booing and hissing. You know, the guy person keeps in. That's my job to make sure that we're not going off on tangents. So let 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 it go. Okay. That's about it. Any questions on the administrative details? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the project or projects. Here's the first project, and this is your big project. It's going to run through the entire semester. In fact, it's starting right now. Right? It's a group project, but here are things that my objective with this project is to take everything we do in this class. Remember, we talked about the spectrum evaluation and apply it on a real company in real time. I'm a great believer in doing things in real time. I, I, there'll be no cases in this class set in 1987, 93, 97. Who cares what happened in 87, 93, or 97? You're going to be valuing your company in real time using every technique we talk about in class. Okay? So my objective is to make sure that that happens. Unlike the corporate finance big project, remember that big project also in my corporate finance class where everything came due on the last day of class and I never, I shouldn't say checked up on you, I nagged you, right, every week, are you done, are you okay? But I never said turn in anything. On this particular project, I will ask you to turn in your discounted cash flow valuation. You're going to see in a minute what that is halfway through the semester. This is for that premature graduation syndrome because I've discovered that in this class, if I let it go, May 2nd, I get emails saying, I haven't picked a company yet. <laughs> will this company work? So to prevent that from happening, I will ask you to turn in your discounted cash flow valuation. But here's the caveat. I will not grade them. So why turn them in? I will actually look at evaluations and give you feedback, try to fix this. So without a grade, say, you know, this number doesn't make sense, try to fix that. Think of that as kind of intermediate feedback, so you're going hopelessly off track. 
you know somewhere halfway through the semester what to fix in evaluation. Okay? The entire project is due on the last day of class. So you know we'll go through that as we get closer to it. But the whole project report, the, all the valuation for your companies, will come due on the very last day of class, which is May 4th. Okay? So yeah, go ahead. That's right. I did, in fact. It's an electronic. I wanted to give you two extra days. For those of you who want to start on May, March 11th. So it's not session 14. It's not session 14. It's actually, the, in fact, this class, to save the rainforest, your projects will be entirely electronic. So you will email you, me your project you know, on the 14th. That way, if it's an Excel spreadsheet, I'll make the comments right on the spreadsheet. I'll email it back to you. If it's a PDF file, I'll... The, so you don't need to physically print it off, and I collect it and take it home and make physical copies and send it back to you. you know, so, and the final project will also be an electronic copy, and the grades will all be on the thing. So that's why, in fact, I made the deadline Friday, is I know that's a week before you leave for your spring break. So if it's in your best interest to get it done by Wednesday, but you want to stretch it out for Friday, I'll wait. There'll be a few of you on Friday. So can you give me till Sunday? No, which is fine. I mean, I, it's, I'm not going to. It's not the end of the world. As I said, it's not graded. It's really for me to give you feedback to you. But do it early enough that I can give you the feedback, and it actually makes a difference. So here's the structure for the project. First, you got to form a group. How big a group? Your groups can be as big as six, seven, eight, even. So if you were, if you really have a group of eight that's been tight, you know how you end up a group of eight that's been tight all this time, and you want to stay as a group of eight, that's fine. Each of you will pick a company. Let me emphasize that again. Right? So don't say, I have a group of eight. We're going to pick five companies. Let's work. If you have eight people, you'll have eight companies. If you have four people, you have four companies. If you have three people, you have three companies. Each of you will pick a company. What are the constraints on picking companies? Unlike corporate finance, I have no constraints. You can pick any company you want. Okay? All I would require of, uh, that I think you need to look for is make sure you have at least one year of financial statements. For obvious reasons, right? Because otherwise you're going to be out there. Okay. And that it's been traded for at least six months or nine months. You have some market history. Right? In fact, even that I'm willing to relax on. If you want to value a private business, I can live with it as long as you can get the financials. Right? You, you know what I mean by the financials. The private business, the owner has to know you and like you. It could be related to you. Don't assume he likes you. So, I mean, he might not trust you. So, lots of reasons. So, is, I'm going to value my uncle's business. Before you make that choice, check with your uncle. Maybe he doesn't want to show you the inside of the business because the tax guy might catch up with him. So, there might be all kinds of reasons why he doesn't want to give you the information. But if you can get the information, and every semester, at least four or five people value private businesses. Usually, they're family business. That's fine. Okay. Here's the overriding constraint. As I said, you seven people, you can pick seven companies. They don't have to be in the same sector. They don't have to be in the same country. But here's the overriding constraint. At least one person in each group has to pick a company that's losing money. Why? Because, as I said, if a company is making money, it's far easier to value the company than losing money. Don't worry, you'll have no trouble finding companies like these now. Okay? Okay. At least one of your companies has a high growth potential, not in terms of earnings. Could be revenue growth. So I want some small, high-growth company there. At least one of your companies has to be a non-US company, and you have to value that company in the local currency. No cheating, picking the ADR, doing games here. I want to see the company valued in the local currency. And at least one company has to be a service company. It could be a retail company. It could be a financial service company. But that's kind of redundant when you talk about money-losing companies. So once you've got the financial service company, you've got the money-losing company as well. So no. <laughs> So at least one company in each group has made these. You, can you load up more than one constraint on one company? You form a group of five. And some, a six person comes to you and begs to be let in. Here's your bargaining chip. You can become part of our group, but you got the money losing, high growth, non-US service company. Let them deal with it, right? Okay. <laughs> it is far more difficult when you got one of these things going on. But I'll tell you something. If you really want to understand valuation, pick a troublesome company. Don't pick Ford. That's asking for trouble. But pick a company where there are things going on that really make it difficult, because it's in the process of working through it that you're going to figure out how to extend the tools of valuation. Okay? I will put up a list of money losing, but don't, don't be the list I put up on my website as the, as the final list. You can go to Capital IQ. Okay? And just check for high growth companies or money losing companies. You know? So it's very easy to find these companies. 
just be, just be creative. Pick a company that you're either interested in or that you used to work at. So pick a company that you have some connection to, so that you have some sense of what they're doing, but you're free beyond that constraint. What are you going to do with your company first? Remember the first 12 sessions of this class is about doing an intrinsic valuation. You're going to do a discount cash flow valuation, an intrinsic valuation of your company. In fact, my suggestion is as we go through sessions 3 through 10, laying out the inputs, estimate the inputs for your company, cash flows, discount rates. So by the time you get to the 10th session, you've got all your you know, numbers lined up. You can actually do the discounted cash flow valuation. Right? So the first part, and that's the part that's due in that halfway through the semester on, the, on March 13th. Once we come back from the break, I'm going to ask you to value a company relative to other companies in the sector. So this is classic relative valuation done right. So you pick a multiple, pick comparables, and you try to figure out ways to control for differences across the companies. Because no matter how careful you are, there will be differences. So you're going to value a company relative to other companies. Okay? Those of you who have trouble saying, well, how will I get the data? There are lots of ways you can get that relative valuation data. As we get closer, we'll talk about that. So you're going to value a company relative to other companies. So you're going to have, at this stage, an intrinsic value for your company and a relative value relative to other companies in the sector. Then I'm going to ask you a, a slightly different question. Value your company relative to the entire market. You think, why would that be different? Relative valuation by its very nature is a function of who you compare your company to. Right? If you pick a different group, you can come up with a different value for your company. So I'm going to say, hey, if you looked at your company relative to the entire market, what value would you attach to the company? So at this stage, you're going to have three values for your company, an intrinsic value, a value relative to the sector, a value relative to the market. You might say, why am I keeping track of this? In a minute, you're going to see why this is going to potentially blow up in a nightmare for you in step six. For some of you, and it's only a subset, maybe one out of every five companies, there's going to be a possibility of applying option pricing models to your company. I'm going to try to make you do that. As I said, most of you will not, this will not apply, but for those of you who apply, this will be a fourth value for your company. Intrinsic value relative to the sector, relative to the market, and option pricing value. And then towards the last week, I'm going to say, hey, now that you have all these values for your company, tell me, would you buy or sell this company? And no weaseling out. You know what I'm talking about? No semi-weak buy, semi-strong buy. I feel no. it doesn't work that way. You pick up the phone and you call your broker and you say, "Give me a semi-strong buy of a thousand shares." It doesn't work that way. you either buy or you sell. There's all you know. One of my objectives in this class is to narrow the what I call the cop-out group to a smaller group as possible. There's always a holdout group. <laughs> Fifteen people will not take a stand. You might end up being there, but I'm going to try to force you to one side or the other. And now, do you see why having four different values for your company is potentially going to be a problem? Why is it going to be a problem? What am I asking you? Is this stock cheap or expensive, right? Relative to what? You have four different values for your company. Your nightmare scenario, of course, is you get to that, or maybe it's not a nightmare scenario because it will force you to make choices, is you get to that last week and you have four values for your company. Two are on one side of the price, two are on the other side of the price. The question I'm asking you is, now that you've valued a company using all these different approaches, which one are you going to hang your hat on? Which one do you trust the most? Which one are you going to base the recommendation on? You think that's pretty tricky. That's part of the process of understanding valuation is to recognize how to decide between different valuation numbers from different approaches and deciding which one you're going to trust in your valuation. In the last class, as I said, you will be turning in your project, but in the weekend before the last class, just as in corporate finance, I'll ask you to send me your numbers. What numbers? Current price, the value that you attach to the company, intrinsic value, relative value, your recommendation, buy or sell. And in the very last class, assuming you all do your thing and get it to me by, the, by midnight the previous night, you'll see a spreadsheet of every company that's been value, being valued in this class. There are 155 people in the class. There should be 155 companies. You're going to see the price, the values that you estimated for the companies. I'm going to list the 10 companies that came out as most undervalued using your numbers with a disclaimer. No, the disclaimer is going to say, if you make decisions based on these numbers, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's valuation, okay? The 10 most overvalued companies, and here's the pledge I will make. Every semester that I've taught this class, I've taken one of the 10 stocks that have come out as most undervalued, and I've bought the stock. You might wonder how I decide which one of the 10 to buy. Guess what I do? No, of course I'm not going to do my own valuation. I'm too lazy to do that. I actually send you an email. 
And it asks you a very simple question. You know what the question is? Are you buying? If you hedge, you say, I don't have enough money to buy. I don't feel confident enough to buy. You know what? You can show me all the valuations. What? I'm not buying either. So the first thing I'm looking for is, are you putting your money behind your valuation? If you are, then I'm willing to join you. Okay. How much? One share won't do. <laughs> Maybe you can show me a wealth pie chart and one share. Maybe it's 90% of your value. So, <laughs> Maybe you're valuing Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know. You know, it could be any company. You know? I'm looking to see whether you actually trust your valuation enough to put some real money on it. Okay? And I'll show you what that portfolio of companies I've bought based on this class has done over the last 20 years. And it's pretty interesting uh, is looking at the dynamics of your buy and sell recommendations. So that's that first project. will run through the entire class. What's the second project? It's a mystery project. What is it about? That's the mystery. Hey, every semester I wait for something to hit the news, and then I say, hey, you know what? This semester, this will be a mystery project. So as an, a couple of examples, two years ago, there was all this talk about breaking up Time Warner. So I prepared all the numbers for Time Warner, and I gave it to every group. And every group would then look at Time Warner and say, okay, you know, got the numbers. Tell me whether Time Warner is more wor worth more as a sum of its parts than as a publicly traded company. So in other words, it'll take the techniques you've learned in class and apply it in the specific context of something that's going on in the market right now. Last semester, I had a plethora of things I could have applied. Now, I could have given them Volkswagen and said, what do you think about Volkswagen? Can you, for those of you not familiar, Volkswagen for a very brief period last, in a, I think in October, November, was the most highly, had the highest market cap in the world. Because there was a short, uh, there, was a, there were a bunch of equity, private equity investors that sold short who then tried to cover their short sales, but there weren't enough shares out there. So, it, it, so it'll be something in the news. I haven't figured out what it's going to be because I don't know what's going to be in the news 10 weeks from now. So I'll figure something out, okay? You, you get a two week window between the time you get the, the project and everybody will get the same numbers and when the project is due. Okay? That's about it. Any questions on the detail? I would prefer that. I mean, I frankly, if you wanted to create kind of moving groups, I don't have a problem with it. Eh? But it's just from your own perspective, it might be good to work with the same group. One more thing I want to add. There's far less of a group component on the, the, the big valuation project than there was in the corporate finance project. The corporate finance project, I made you guys talk to each other all the time, meet each other. You might have refused to do it, but I kept. On this one, you can pretty much, 90% of this, you do on your own. Right? It's a valuation of your company. What they're doing with their companies has very little relevance to your company. There's very little intra-company comparison here. So if you want to sit there, you're a loner, and you want to get your project done, you can get it done next week. This does not... So that, again, reflects the fact that your second-year MBAs, you're getting tired of looking at these people over and over again, group after group. You don't want to be with them. You want to just get out of here. So I've kind of built it into the project description that if you never want to see another second-year MBA again, that that can be accomplished. You can do it over email, maybe through video cast, whatever you want to do. Okay. Any, que any other questions on, on the project? So that's, that's pretty much the administrative stuff. Let me close that up. And turn to the third packet that you had today. Okay. As I said, these next two sessions, I want to lay a philosophical foundation for why I do valuation. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of this class, I've been teaching valuation now for 23 years. And when I first started teaching valuation, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was. I've discovered since that this is a terrible mistake, that most people don't care about valuation. By most people, I include most equity research and most people who claim to do valuation for a living don't believe in it. You're saying, but they do it all the time. You're right. They do it all the time, but their heart's not in it. They do it because they're supposed to do it. They do it because it's in their job description. They do it to cover their rear end. But if you caught them in an honest moment, or when they're drunk, which might be the same thing, <laughs> and ask them, why is Google trading at $290 per share? You know what the answer you're going to get is? Because that's what the market thinks it's worth. A lot of people who do valuation think that this is an entire waste of time, that this is an exercise in futurity. 
that price is set by demand and supply, and there's no point really exploring the fundamentals of drive valuation. Obviously, I don't believe that. If I believed that, I wouldn't be teaching this class. So I want to start off by explaining why I think valuation matters, why I do valuation. I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. Heard of lemmings? Lemmings became famous or infamous in the 1950s. When National Geographic went to this Pacific island, they filmed the most amazing sight. Thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures, that's what lemmings look like, so don't glamorize them, gathered together, ran right off the cliff into an ocean and committed collective suicide. And ever since, one of those big questions has been, why do they do it? Why do lemmings commit collective suicide? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not a lemming psychiatrist. But let's do some virtual imagery. You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast. He couldn't stop off the cliff into the ocean. Incidentally, these guys can't swim, so that kind of seals the deal. Dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy. Couldn't stop either. Slid right off the cliff into the ocean. But I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the last lemming. That I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but can hang in there anyway. Okay? Of the very last lemming in that group, you're on a beautiful Pacific Islands, 85 degrees out there. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. You with me? You'd have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? One part of you, left brain, right brain, whatever part of you is rational, assuming there's a rational part. You say, stop, don't do it. But then you hear this voice in the back of your head. You know what it's saying? They must know something that I don't. Remember those seven words. They must know something that I don't. They're the seven most deadly words in investing in valuation. You know when you'll hear it? Let's say value Google. Let's say when it was at $700 per share. Remember those days? You value Google and you come up with $250 per share. What's your rational side saying? Don't buy that stock. It's overvalued, right? But then you hear this voice in the back of your head, they must know something that you don't. It speaks in a monotone, don't ask me why. <laughs> and when you hear that voice, magical things start to happen to your valuation. You know what I'm talking about? Your cash flows go up, your discount rates go down. 250 becomes 300, becomes 350, becomes 400, becomes 450, and you're not gonna stop till you get to 700. Don't fight it, there's a lemming dying to get out of each and every one of you, let it out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? You know what they do. <laughs> they look for a crowd and they join and you're buying, I'm buying, you're selling, I'm selling. Why? I don't care. I can't even believe people go around and say, I'm a momentum investor. Might as well say, I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. <laughs> The second group of investors I call Yogi Bear lemmings. Have you ever seen Yogi Bear cartoons? You know what he used to say, right? He was smarter than the average bear. These lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. What they really want to do is run with the crowd to the very edge of the cliff and at the last moment, we are away. Great, right? If you can pull it off, you get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Admit it, you're tempted. You're saying, I'm at Stern, 10th ranked according to this morning's Financial Times. I am smarter than these average lemmings. I can pull that off. In case you're tempted, I'd remind you of the immortal words of Stanley Druckenmiller. Remember that guy? Anybody remember? He used to be George Soros' portfolio manager. Key word is used to be. He got fired in 2001 after he made a big bet on tech stocks that went bad. So the press conference, he gets up, and uh, one of the reporters asks him, Mr. Druckenmiller, why did you buy all those tech stocks? Did you think they were undervalued when you bought them? And he said, no, no. We knew they were overvalued when we bought them. So why did you buy them? He said, because we thought we could get out before the correction hit. And he used some baseball terminology. If you don't follow baseball, convert to whatever sport you follow. He said, we thought we were in the top of the eighth inning when, in fact, we were in the bottom of the ninth. You know what he was saying in lemming terminology, right? He said, we thought we were five feet away from the cliff when, in fact, we were three feet past the cliff. At which point, John said, oh my God, it was back there. And then gravity works its magic on you like everybody else, right? You know the problem trying to be smarter than the average lemming is? Nobody knows where the cliff is coming. Don't let anybody tell you different. 
Anybody who tells you they have a model that tells you when the next correction is going to hit is lying. For a simple reason. Lemmings do rational things, right? How do you build a model to forecast what crazy people will do? That's basically what these people claim. I have a model that tells you when crazy people will stop being crazy. <laughs> what makes them crazy is you can't forecast what they're going to do. So I can't pull off being a proud lemming. I'm definitely not smarter than the average lemming. I don't know what the cliff is coming. If you ask me to describe myself as an investor, that's me. A lemming with a life vest. That's all I can aspire to be. You know what I'm trying to say is, you are all human beings. We're going to get caught up in the mood of the moment. Don't tell me that you're not. If everybody is bullish, you're going to be bullish too. Between September and December, everybody else was scared. You were scared too. That's human nature. It's built into your genes. Not your what you're wearing, but the, the actually. <laughs> this goes back. Evolution does it, right? Because that's the way human beings survived. Is you saw every other caveman run, you better run too. Because who knows what was chasing those cavemen around? We're human. We're going to get caught up in the mood of the moment. We're going to behave like lemmings no matter how much we resolve that we're not going to do it. You know what valuation does? It slows the process down. It allows your rational side to make an argument. Nine times out of ten, you're going to ignore it. You're going to do whatever you want. But maybe that one time out of ten, you listen to it, and it could save you a ton of money. So my objective for this class is way down here. It's not to make you supremely rational investors, because we're never going to be there. It's to give you the tools and the techniques to slow the process down and think about the other side, even when everybody else is kind of jumping in and buying or selling and say, hey, you know what? Maybe there's another side of the process. So that's basically why I think valuation matters. Because valuation allows me to think about the other side of the picture, even if everybody's optimistic or pessimistic. Now, as to the, the claim that perception is all that matters. As I said, a lot of people who do valuation base it on the fact that they think perception is what matters, that all these things about cash flows, growth rates, risk really doesn't make an issue. In fact, I'm going to read a statement from an equity research report. I didn't make these words up. This is an actual statement right out of an equity research report. A guy called Henry Blodgett wrote it. Heard of this guy? What was, fam what, you know, what, what was he famous for? He was, the do he was a dot-com analyst star in the late 90s for Merrill Lynch. In fact, he's now, the SEC came down on him because he did a stupid thing. He put out buy recommendations on companies and bad-mouthed it internally in emails to his colleagues that the company is not that good. So basically, the lesson here is you're going to bad-mouth the company and putting a buy recommendation, don't put it down on paper. Don't put it in an email because that's basically how he got caught. This is from an equity research report in 2000 that he released in a company called Internet Capital. Don't even ask me what it does. It was just some kind of dot-com company. Dot-com banking. Just send your money online. We'll do whatever we want with it. Okay? This is from the report. He says, valuation is often not a helpful tool in determining when to sell hyper-growth stocks. What the heck does that mean? That's like a doctor saying whether you have a pulse or not is not that critical in whether you're dead or alive. How can valuation not be a defining variable in when you buy or sell stocks? But hidden in that statement is at least an honest admission that hey, he was basing this buy recommendation on something other than the value of the company. Demand and supply will push the price up, so we'll basically go with it. The notion that perception is all that matters when you look at market prices is deeply held, even among people who call themselves value investors. Does perception matter, you think? Absolutely. The same company today is perceived to be valued less than it was worth six months ago. I'm not saying perceptions don't matter. My issue is if you tell me that perception is all that matters, you're missing the point. At least with financial, financial assets. If you have a Picasso and you say perception is all that matters, I agree with you. I mean, I still remember taking my youngest, who's now nine, into, I know they had a Picasso exhibition there and he was interested in painting. So I took him in, it was when he was five or six, and he wasn't impressed. He said, this guy's got the nose in the wrong place in every picture. Because you've seen Picasso, the nose out of the side of the head, out of the top of the head, all kinds of places. So I said, Kieran, how much would you pay for that picture? Or oh, that painting, he said, about five, six dollars. <laughs> I said, you know what? If everybody agreed with you, that's what would happen to the price. If you're talking about a Picasso, it's all perception. It's not that their cash flows or intrinsic value, it's all based on perception. 
If you're talking about a collectible, that's exactly how you value the asset. But if you're talking about a stock or a bond, to argue that perception is all that matters misses the point. There is an underlying reality here that you can't run away from. If you try, it's going to catch up with you. And my point is we have to take into account that underlying reality. When perceptions deviate from reality, reality doesn't change. The perceptions have to change. So there's a postscript, the Internet Capital Group, when you put the buy recommendation out, it was at 174. So you should never listen to your equity research analysts. One year later, it was trading at $3. Okay. So I guess our only consolation didn't go to zero. Our even bigger consolation, it can't go below zero. Notice that the, well, the nice thing about stocks is you can never lose more than you actually invested. Right. So as we go through this process, we will kind of come back to this issue because hidden behind a lot of statements here about valuation are misconceptions about what drive valuation. In fact, I'm going to close off today with three broad misconceptions that drive how people think about valuation and what the implications are. Here's the first one. Evaluation is an objective search for the truth. You're some kind of scientist sitting there estimating the value of an asset. You know what feeds into this is we sit in front of computers, we feed numbers into models, and after a while we convince ourselves, I'm being objective. Look, I'm just entering the numbers. There's no qualitative factor here. Nothing is subjective. Dispense with that notion, there are no objective valuations. All valuations are biased. You know why they're biased? Because when you sat down to value the company, you brought in everything you thought about that company into the valuation. It's going to find a way into your valuation. I'll give you a personal example. I have valued Microsoft every year since 1987. That is one year after their IPO. First time I valued Microsoft. That's what, 22 years in a row I valued Microsoft. Every time I valued Microsoft, I found it to be overvalued. Two dollars, four, you name the price, I found it overvalued at that price. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equity markets of the 20th century, I wouldn't have touched it one step of the way. I could give you access to every single valuation I've done of Microsoft. You could plumb through the valuations looking for clues as to why I found it overvalued, but you'd be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to find, find out why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is come up to my office. Any of you from office? First thing on the door, you'll see an apple. You step in, it's like a shrine to Apple. <laughs> I've been a Mac user since 1982. Very first Mac. I've actually got saved that. To me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. Let me be specific about it. Darth Vader in episodes four, five, and six. So not Anakin Skywalker Darth Vader, but Darth <laughs> Darth Vader, right? <laughs> Every time I sit down to value Microsoft, all the bad thoughts about Bill Gates, and I have a lot of them bubble up to the surface. <laughs> and how does it manifest itself? Valuation is you're constantly coming to forks in the road, right? High risk or low risk, high growth or low growth, and guess which one I take when I come to Microsoft? High risk or low risk? Of course high risk. The whole thing is going to blow up with a virus any day now. <laughs> high growth or low growth? Who'd buy that Vista program? Piece of crap. Low growth. By the time I make my choice at the end of the process, Guess what? I found Microsoft to be overvalued. Here's my follow-up to that proposition. Most people who do valuation for a living get paid to do valuations, right? You tell me who pays you to do a valuation. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. I'll give you my favorite story for this. So in the early 1990s, a company called Lynn Cable. AT&T had this option to buy 49% of Lynn. This was an AT&T actually had money to buy other companies. Those days have long passed. AT&T had this option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. So the time for the option to be exercised comes about. AT&T goes and hires Morgan Stanley. So you guys are going to be Morgan Stanley. Your job is to appraise the value of the 49% of Lynn Cable so I can buy it. Lynn Cable goes out and hires Lehman Brothers. So you guys are going to be Lehman Brothers. Don't take it personally. <laughs> I'm not making any value judgments on you or your potential for bankruptcy. That's a different issue. <laughs> so Lynn Broadcasting goes to Lehman Brothers, asks them to do the same thing. Value the 49% so we can sell it. So you work for the buyer, you work for the seller, right? Two major investment banks, two valuation teams go to work on the same company with the same information. One investment bank comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. Now, who do you think came back with $105 per share? 
Morgan Stanley or, or Lehman? Why? Not because of the model they used or the assumptions they made, but because they worked for the buyer. Your job, if you're the investment banker for the buyer, is to come in with a low number. You work for the seller, you come in with a high number. In fact, the difference here was so large, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why settle for two fees when you can have three, I guess? <laughs> and they call in Wasserstein Perella. You heard of these guys? We'll talk about them a lot. They're the centerpieces for everything that can be done badly in valuation and still make a lot of money. So if you're Wasserstein Perella, you're right in the middle here, right? 105, 155. You don't want to piss off either side too much. That's a, that's a financial term, actually. Because you've got to work with Lehman in the future. You've got to work with Morgan Stanley in the future. 105, 155. Where's the safest place for you to be? They came back with $127.50. <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a little secret in valuation. If you're ever asked to value something, never, ever come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me the target price is 40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal point will do in terms of creating an illusion that you actually know what you're doing. <laughs> People say, oh God, my God, look, he's got the second decimal point nailed down. I'm not asking this guy questions. <laughs> Here's one of the great tragedies in valuation. In most valuations, the value gets set first, the valuation follows. People decide what to pay, and they go looking for justification to pay it. Bias is the biggest enemy of good valuation. It's not bad models, it's not bad data, it's bias. You enter a process bias, what's come, going to come out as output is going to reflect that bias. In fact, there are lots of outfits, outfits like Wasserstein Perella. The way I describe them is they couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. They'll come up with some strange metric for doing it because they're so driven by the deal, by getting the deal done, by getting it to work, that they really don't care about what the value is. So when you look at valuations, recognize that bias is the biggest enemy of good valuation. Second misconception about valuation. If I do a good valuation, I will get the right answer. When does this get started? And I told you my youngest is already nine, almost ten. You can see this already starting to get into play, right? It started when you went to first grade. And the teacher put a problem in front of him. Three plus two. You either get the right answer, which is five. If you get any answer other than five, you must have done something wrong, right? This gets drummed into us all the way through school. And God help you if you become an engineer. Then you get five more years. If you do things right, you get the right answer. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. So you become an engineer. You discover they don't pay engineers very much. So you come back to business school, hoping to make that leap into investment banking. Many of you, how many of you are engineers in this class? See how it is. Career switches, right? As I've said, when I, after I taught this class 22 years, like clockwork, I can predict what's going to happen in this class. Around the 12th week, maybe 15 or 16 of you, many of you engineers are going to show up in my office. You're going to come in. You're going to put a valuation down on my desk. I'm done with my valuation. Could you take a look at it and tell me whether I got the right answer? I'm going to take the valuation. I'm telling you in advance what's going to happen. I'm going to give it back to you and say, I don't know what the right answer is. And your faith in the whole system is going to start to crack. <laughs> You can say, you teach the class, you don't know what the right answer is. If I knew what the right answer was, why would I be teaching this class? <laughs> Think about it, right? <coughs> At this stage, you can see one of two things happening. Some people can't handle this. Not knowing what the right answer is. You know what happens to them, right? They become fixed income people. Fine, let them go. <laughs> it's so much more consoling to sit there with a 10-year bond, 7% coupon rate, while you're just about defaulters. It's not a whole lot of fun, but the world needs boring people, right? <laughs> okay, go be a fixed income person. The other half says, this is kind of fun. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never ever conclusively be wrong. Think about that. <laughs> when you value a stock, you can never ever be conclusively wrong. You pick a stock, it goes on 37 years in a row. You know what you're going to tell me? The time horizon is not long enough. It goes bankrupt. The system got in the way, right? If it hadn't gone bankrupt, it would bounce back. Lehman would be worth $85 now. I think it's kind of fun that there is nobody out there that says, this is the right answer. 
But it effectively also means you got to be willing when you do equity valuation, you value businesses to deal with a. You have to have a high tolerance for ambiguous answers. If you want precise answers, you want to know at the end of the process, did I get this right? Don't expect a feedback mechanism. You say you got that right, you got that wrong. Okay. But here's, I think, the irony: not all companies create the same amount of angst when you value them. Some companies are easier to value than others, right? I gave you a regulated utility like Con Ed. You're going to have far less uncertainty in valuing than when you value Google. So some people say, well, let's use discounted cash flow valuation only for the companies where we feel secure about the numbers. You know what? They're missing the point. The payoff to doing valuation is actually greater with Google than with Con Ed. You know why? Because the payoff to valuation is how precise your valuation is relative to other people valuing exactly the same company. You don't compare how precise a valuation is across companies. You think about it. If I'm valuing Google and somebody else is valuing Google, is my valuation more precise than theirs? The payoff to doing valuation is greatest when you're most uncomfortable doing the valuation. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you will get there. As you sit there to value a company, I'm going to ask you questions like, what will the revenue growth rate be five years from now? And your first reaction is going to be to flee. So I have no idea what it is. Why is he asking me this question? But in valuation, if you can persevere, make your best estimates, the payoff is far greater. So the payoff to doing valuation is actually greater for growth companies and for mature companies. The payoff to doing valuation is greater in, develop, in emerging markets than in developed markets. The payoff to doing valuation is greater now than it was six months ago. Why? Because there's more uncertainty. You know what most people are doing? In fact, I see this all the time in journalism. I see analysts saying, there's no point doing valuation. It's too uncertain. This is exactly the point in time when doing valuation is going to give you a payoff because most people have given up. They're heading for the exits. They're not looking for cash flows. They're looking over their shoulder, they're looking across, they're seeing what everybody else is doing. They've given up on valuation. This is precisely the time when the payoff is going to be greatest. Which brings me to the third misconception by valuation. If I make my model bigger, it's going to get better. It's so easy to build a big model now, right? It's an Excel, you keep adding cells. Crystal ball is free, right? No, it's still for you as MBAs. Put a crystal ball on top, you run Monte Carlo simulations. Models start small, they always get bigger. And God help you if there's a team in the basement in your company working on this model. You know what I'm talking about? Geek City, they come in, they send to the basement, work on models. They love building macros on top of macros on top of macros. They love building models. They act like you have an infinite amount of time to value every company. They start with 10, then they I keep another five inputs, another five. Before you know it, they've built this elaborate valuation model that requires 85 inputs to value one company. Two things happen with these models. One is what I call input fatigue. Is that input fatigue is? If you haven't already felt it, you will feel it, assuming you do get a job in investment banking. It'll happen around 11.30 on a Saturday night. <laughs> you've been working all day, all week, all year. Pretty much you've been working nonstop since you got hired. Finally, you're done. 11.30 on a Saturday night. You get ready to shut your terminal down, put everything away, and go home. Your managing director comes and puts a 10K on your desk. I want this company valued on my desk first thing tomorrow morning. Why? <laughs> Sunday morning. This is his trial by fire. He wants to see how much you really want this job. Now, part of you wants to exercise your option to abandon. I won't even describe what that looks like. The other part of you says, well, okay, you know what? I'm doing it. So you sit down and start entering the numbers into that 85 input spreadsheet. You get to about the 15th input and the clock strikes midnight. And you're not Cinderella. <laughs> now you look down, your stomach drops, there are 70 more inputs to go. You look at the 16th input. It asks you, what was the inventory five years ago? Now, who asks questions like this? It's almost like they're trying to torture you. Now, part of you wants to get up and go look up that number, but that part is too exhausted to get out of the chair. The other part of you says, enter a random number. Let's move on. And it's amazing how quickly the random numbers roll out. And the scary thing is when the output comes out, it all looks the same. That number you toiled two hours over, the random number all kind of melt together. Here's another little secret in valuation. You want to hide your random number inputs. You know what you should do? Create more detail in your output. Have 500 line items. Nobody will have any idea what's random, what's not. Here's a test I do on valuations. When I pick up a valuation, it runs 35 pages. I don't even look at the valuation. So what are you trying to hide from me? Good valuations should be parsimonious. 
basically less is more don't add detail unless you can bring something into the detail to improve your valuation so input fatigue last point when you use these models they become black boxes you feed numbers and number comes out on the other side I still remember a conversation I had about 15 years ago with an equity research analyst at JP Morgan. He valued a company. I was very familiar with the company. At a target price of 85, stock was trading at 35. So I asked him, how, how do you come up with this high price for the you know, value for this? He said, I didn't do it. So what do you mean you didn't do it? Your name's on the report. It says $85. He said, I didn't do it. So who did it? He said, ValueMac did it. I said, who the heck is ValueMac? He 